Richard Kapuscinski, Paul Schaeffer. No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying hello to you. Uh, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend a special welcome to the ambassador of Poland, Maria Wodzinska. And um, we consider ourselves very lucky with uh, her active interest in our program tonight and in the presence of Richard Kapuscinski and Paul Scheffer. My name is Anne Wertheim and I am the director of the John Adams Institute. For the past decade, we've been organizing about 11 lectures, readings and discussions per year by bringing a wide range of American authors and opinion makers to Amsterdam. But before you start wondering why the Polish author Richard Kapuscinski is taking part in an American lecture series, in fact, if my information is correct, he has never even written about North America. I would like to explain that Mr. Kapuscinski is an exception to the rule. Our institute considers Mr. Kapuscinski, who was born in Poland, a world citizen whose work crosses borders. Mr. Kapuscinski, we have, no, you can stay there. We are, ve <laughs> we are very honored <laughs> that you participate in our program. We understand that from next month, Mr. Kapuscinski is done with traveling and intends to concentrate solely on his writing. So we are very lucky to have him here tonight. Tonight's event will take the form of a public interview. Mr. Kapuscinski feels more comfortable with that, and he considers it more dynamic. Mr. Schaeffer and Mr. Kapuscinski will first draw a picture of Kapuscinski's life and work, after which the evening will take its natural flow, including, of course, a discussion on Mr. Kapuscinski's latest book, Ebony, Ebenhout, Afrikanische Fever, The Shadow of the Sun, a book on Africa with a multitude of different titles. Our interviewer tonight is Paul Scheffer. Mr. Scheffer has written extensively on political issues and taught modern history in several universities in the Netherlands. Aside from writing for NRC Handelsblad, Mr. Scheffer last year made an hour-long interview with Richard Kapuscinski for the broadcasting company VPRO. You, the audience, are free tonight to come to the microphone and join in the discussion. There are two microphones in the aisles. For those of you who are seated upstairs, please stand up and speak loudly and clearly. Tonight's event is being filmed by Cairo Broadcasting Company for their news program, Network. They will do their utmost to not disturb you. Network plans to broadcast three programs in which Mr. Kapuscinski will feature. I don't know when it will be broadcast, but you have to be watchful. We will round up the evening at around 9.30. Without intermission, we will continue. Mr. Kapuscinski will sign books after the lecture, seated at a table in the hall. One word before Paul Schreffer and Richard Kapuscinski take the podium, and it's in my purse too, the, the telephone. We have to remind everyone with a cell phone to uh, switch them off now, and I have to do it myself to re remind me. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you enjoyed tonight's program. Mr. Schreffer and Mr. Kapuscinski, may I invite you to the podium. Welcome, even a world citizen is born in a specific place and a specific time. So st let's start with the beginning, 1932. He once wrote, people are not made to live in borderline situations. They avoid them or try to flee. Yet you were born in what could be described aptly as a borderline situation in Pinsk. Uh, yeah, it was a, a borderline situation in two in two senses. 
the firstly, the, the, the place is now uh, part of, of uh, Bielorussia uh, Republic, and at that time was a part of Poland, uh, which uh, we lost in, in the Second World War. And uh, secondly, it is it, the borderline was situation because I was born in the, in the very historical moment, in the sense that it was just the moment when uh, on the, in the Germany, the Hitler came to power, exactly that was the time, and it but was... yet the war begins. Yeah. Not uh, with Germany invading, but with Russia with invading. With Russia invading. And secondly, it, it was born just uh, across the border of my place. It was a time when uh, the Stalin murdered over 10 million uh, peasants, uh, Ukrainian peasants. He murdered them because he was afraid they, 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 they would revolt. And he just murdered them by, by sentencing them to, 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 to hunger death. So on the bus, it, the moment was, was very charged with the, with the tensions, which few years later uh, led to the outbreak of the Second World War. But I think for an audience in the Netherlands, it's good to remind that the war started with Russia invading, which gives a completely different experience and perspective to the beginning of the Second World War. Yeah, because is, everybody here remembers and equalizes World War with Germany. It started with, uh, with in, on the 1st of, of September with Germany, but two weeks later, on, on 70, so the same month, the German invaded the, the eastern part of the Europe, and, and then was the beginning of, of, the, of the big world war, which also, which also uh, Holland people suffered much in this war. But if one compares the war in the east with the war in the west, I think there is a huge difference because the war in the East was conceived by Hitler as a war of annihilation and a war of colonial conquest. Exactly, that was the, his idea. His, he, was, he started with annihilation of, of Jew population, and then the, the next victims should be the Slav people of, of the Europe. The Slav people, it means uh, among them was uh, uh, Poland, Polish people. So you have at a very early age, you see your father um, being deported and growing up as a child in this atmosphere of distrust and an atmosphere of fear. What traces did it leave? What experience, um, what meant this experience in your later life? I belong to this generation uh, for, for, for whom the, the, the first experience was war experience. I remember uh, just, uh, 20 years ago, a, a, a Nobel Prize writer, Heinrich Bell, uh, asked a group of, of writers to, to, to write how was the, uh, their experience at the end of the war. This book uh, was published, it's is, is called Das Ende. And when, I, when he invited me to, 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 to write this piece, I was thinking, and I, I thought that for me the end of the war was, was a, a very unusual moment because for me the war was a normal situation. And s suddenly I found myself in the situation that there was no shooting, no killing, no bombardment. And that was uh, for, for, for me very abnormal. So for us the war was a normal situation and that, that probably is, is, is part of the explanation why I, after that I was working up to up today. In this, in this, in the, in the, in the third world uh, uh, countries, in, in the war, in the coup d'etats, in the revolutions, in the hunger, in all this experience which uh, people of the third world are suffering up today. One could say that one of your huge themes in um, your writing is people striving for normality in abnormal situations, trying to live a life in a periphery of violence, distrust. Um, what were your surviving techniques as a child growing up in these circumstances? Just to, to avoid it, to hide them. You know, with children we are trying to, to hide in ourselves in, in all possible places. But this tendency toward normality, I think, is a very, a very deep inside the human nature. When you see the fighting on the streets and suddenly the fighting ends up in the afternoon, in the afternoon people already are 
coming out on the streets and cleaning, you know, and uh, uh, removing the glass, removing the, the ruins, uh, trying to establish immediately uh, something very, uh, very, very natural uh, uh, way of uh, uh, way of living and way of life. So this idea of making yourself smaller than you are, which I often witness um, among people whom you met in Central Europe or farther eastward, the tendency to not to speak too loud, to be modest, invisible. Was it also a means for you to survive in all these circumstances which you searched in the third world, in places where uh, normally people would think better not to go? I think you, you have to adapt yourself to the situations of uh, unusual situations, to adapt yourself to be kind to the other people, to look for the friends, in mm. such a, to immediately establish the, the, the friendship relations, and, uh, and just to be very, very, very watchful, very, very careful. And, uh, and that's, that is the, 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 the way you are trying to survive. But it's not always worth, of course, because many, many of my colleagues uh, are, 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 has, has been killed. Mm -hmm. I think every year we are losing, in my profession, the profession of, of foreign correspondence, of war correspondence, over 100 people are, are killed every year in different fronts of the, of the, of the, of the wars which are taking place in, in our planet. But somehow you never seem um, to be the stereotype of you know, war correspondent. When one meets you and when one has a different idea of who you are, while well, reading your book, you know, struggling with snakes, um, being in the front line and taking risks, uh, which someone who grown up in a place of war, one would think he tries to avoid that. He's seen enough in his youth of death, of dying. Why would he search for those places? I mean, how can one explain this discrepancy between you know, your personal character and the sort of risks you seem to take? You know, the risk is a part of our profession. Once you accept to be a foreign war correspondent, Yes, but you are more than that. Yeah. You're not uh, the type of journalist, you know, going to a shooting, making a report, and then traveling away. I mean, there's a deeper commitment. Well, this is a deeper commitment because I'm fascinating with those events. You know, I'm a historian by, by academic formation. When I was, uh, when I was completing my, my university, uh, there was two possibilities for me. One was to continue with someone's academic career and became the historian, just reading the book and studying the archives and so on. And, but I chose another one, which fascinates me, uh, the, 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 to, to, to be observer of history in making. Mm -hmm. And of course, 20th century is a, a century of history. Uh, uh, 20th century, and especially 20th century was, for me, a very important uh, century which we, not, not all of us understand this, because usually we, we, we consider the 20th century as a century of dictatorship, of, of communism, of uh, fascism, of uh, totalitarianism, and things like that. But the uh, 20th century was a unique in, in the history of mankind, because it was, a, it was a century in which the third world has been birthed. When we take the map of the, of, the, of, the, of the world, the map of our planet, beginning of the 20th century and the end of the century, we have completely two different uh, maps uh, before our eyes. Uh, the, the, there is a one map which was the beginning of century, and this map has few independent countries, and the rest is a, is a world of colonies or semi-colonies, dependent territories. When we, we, we see at the map which we have now using, the map of the end of the, uh, of, of the, of, of the century, the, 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 world is, the whole world is independent world. We have about 200 uh, states, independent states, at least legally independent yes, legally. states, yes. Uh, uh, and uh, with a tendency, still with a tendency of creating a new and new states, and uh, so we are living in a completely two different worlds during this century. And such an event, like a creation of the of the 
whole humanity starting to live independent political life is a unique event in the history of mankind. It was never before like this, and it will never happen again. So uh, we are very, I, I being uh, witness of this phenomenon, I, I, I feel very, very lucky of, of professionally to, to be able to see this, the, the, the independence of Africa, the independence of, uh, of Asia, the independence of certain territories of, of Latin America, uh, because I, I could observe this, I, I could uh, write about this, and I, I could I could show this this this, this, this phenomenon of, of creating of, of of a new man, of uh, a new citizen of, of our uh, human community. So, but this hope and this um, what afterwards might be described to some extent as an illusion of a new beginning and of a complete new era era. Um, I think it's not the only reason for you going to Africa. Perhaps it was also a way of escaping uh, the grayness and also the limited room of maneuver in post-war uh, Poland. Let's not forget we're talking now yeah. about the 50s. Of course. And uh, with it, few possibilities it, of independent uh, journalism. It was a very hard time. It was a, a strong censorship. We, are de we were a dependent country ruled by, by the communist regime. And uh, the, 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 the possibilities to, 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 to write in our country was a very limited. But if you were writing, if the, so the solution, one of the solutions was to go uh, outside. But uh, to, to write about Europe was also very, very, very for, for political reasons, was also very limited possibilities. But if you go but out of the But there was a Europe, shared euphoria yeah. about, of course, liberation movements yeah, and but the process if you go of decolonization. To, yes, if that you was, go so to, to speak, say, politically correct. Absolutely. No? That was politically correct. That was uh, uh, the, the, the room for writing. And uh, that was a very, very important advantage uh, because the, uh, you know, nobody knows much about Africa, mm -hmm. of the censorship people and so on. Nobody understood where is Burundi or where is Zambia or where is, uh, Boom, uh, where is Angola and so should we support or no. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll have also troubles at, at that time, but, uh, but, but the possibility of writing was, was, was much, much, much greater. But you took a risk uh, by joining a profession, profession where in a situation where one ought better not to ask too much questions. Yeah, you but I was... Join a profession where asking questions, yeah. and exactly the way you did it, was asking questions and searching, was not per se the wisest thing to do. Yeah, but that was so fascinating, you know, I was a young man, and it was so fascinating to discover the, for me, the, 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 the new world completely. <coughs> The, the, the new frontiers, the new cultures, the, 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 the new people. Uh, the, 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 I was ready to, to do everything just to, to have this possibility to, to observe this and to write about this. But to observe this, this is of course, um, while reading your books, not a neutral sentence. Because yeah. observing for you means, for example, starting a book about uh, Haile Selassie, perhaps your most famous book about um, the emperor was a very specific sentence. It starts like it was a small dog of Japanese breeding. Its name was Lulu. That is, you could say, an observation. But why start with that observation? Because, uh, you know, after some times of writing, being a journalist, like in every profession, you become, uh, the, the danger is to, to, to to, to run into the, into the routine situation, into the journalism. And usually, usually the, the, the journalism is a, 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 it's a very conservative profession. You are, you are, you are working uh, with 600 words. You are repeating uh, the formulas of, uh, of, of reporting. They are very similar. So I, I thought after some time, after describing uh, about 20 or, or more than the, uh, the coup d'etat and revolution, I said, no, I will not write this way anymore. I have to find out the, the, the new way of writing. But why this, did that moment arrive? Was it, um... I, f I just was fed up with, with this, and I came from, uh, from this, uh, from, uh, from this uh, coup d'etat in, uh, in uh, Ethiopia, and I saw how to write the book about this. Mm -hmm. 
because uh, to write about the tanks on the street, you know, the, the, the shooting on the street, and that is every, everywhere in every cover, in every report. So I said I have to write a completely different book. But it's very difficult to write a completely different book because it is, uh, it is very, e very difficult to, to, to find a, a new formula, to, to, to find a new way of writing. And uh, the, the world is, is full of writing, the world is full of books. And uh, so you, 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 I was suffering a lot, I was trying to find the, the way of, of, of writing. My boss asking me, give me material, give me material. I said, no, I, I have to, 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 to find out something. And eventually in, in, the, in, the, in the state of complete depression and complete despair, I was thinking how to find uh, the, the, the first sentence. And suddenly I saw this emperor because I, I knew him and I knew his court. And the uh, description of the court was also very dull, very boring. But I, I, I remember that uh, Emperor Haile Selassie had a small dog, and he liked so much about this, this dog. So I think I will start with description of this dog. Uh, revolution, uh, I was the, uh, revolution of, of, of Ethiopia will start with description of the dog of the emperor. And I, I wrote this sentence. And when I wrote this sentence, I knew, I knew that I have the book. Because I wrote this sentence uh, that the, the, the emperor has this, uh, this dog, and this dog was, has a habit of, of making pee on the shoes of, the, of, of, of his court ministers. Mm -hmm. And then I, I describe, and I, uh, then I start to describe these ministers. Then I describe to, 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 to describe what they, they were talking. I let them to talk. And they start this fascination description of the place of the power. And the book is not about the emperor, and the book is not about the, uh, the dog. The book, the, re the real sense of the book, is the book about how the politics change the people. Mm -hmm. You are the normal person, and suddenly by, by chain of circumstances, you becoming the politician. And becoming, politi becoming politician, you, you, you are becoming a completely different person. You are very proud, you, you are just talking in a different voice with other people. Mm -hmm. you, are, you, are member of the, uh, you are a member of the establishment. I'm not talking about democratic uh, society, I'm talking about this authoritarian uh, societies, feudal societies, when there is a, a big hierarchy and to be in, in the court of the emperor is something very important. And the language, I was listening to the language these people was, was, was talking. I was listening to the manner these people were behaving themselves. And, I was, and that is a book which I wrote about this. Because these politicians, when next day, but by, by certain reasons, ceased to be a politician, again became normal people. You meet him on the street, you say, say hello, you are talking with him. But you understand by his behavior that he is no more politician. <laughs> so the way you are uh, writing, uh, uh, that, that pheno that this, this phenomenon starts to, to fascinate me. And I start to dig uh, inside the character and, and behavior and mentality of these people. And that is this, 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 this and that was my book about, uh, about uh, revolution. There is not a word about the revolution, really. It is the, the book about the, the relation between men as a human being and politics as certain structure which is changing, which is influencing the behavior and the mentality of, of, of the men. But perhaps there's also another source. Um, you once said that the French historic school of the um, Des Annales, of people like Brodel, also learned you not to look for big political structures, for big political events to explain history, but to look at the ordinary life of ordinary citizens and much more basic uh, factors of society, of history, which have a much longer uh, impact and not the events at the center of power. Yeah, this is uh, the revolution which uh, those people 
introduced into the history. Was the revolution because usually history was writing like the history of kings, like the history of palaces, like the history of uh, wars of dynasties. Uh, a very uh, a traditional history was a very Shakespearean history. Mm. That there was a struggle between the kings for power, for palace. And, uh, and those, uh, the, the, this French school of Michelet started with Michelet. And uh, uh, there was a school who, who has completely different approach to, to the history. For them, the history was everything. The history was a, was a, was a weather of this, of this epoch. The history was a state of the roads of this epoch. The history was the prices of the wheat in this time. The, 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 the history was a, was, a, uh, was a way the construction was... was, was uh, everything became the history. You know? And you have in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Dutch tradition, the very beautiful, great example of the, of the Dutch painting of, of 17th century, of the golden age in, of, of, of Dutch history. When you have the, the, this great collection of the, of the great painters who are painting, who are leaving us the history of, of, of that time in, 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 in Holland, as a history of the things, you know, the the uh, the the interior of the of the uh, of the bourgeois house in Amsterdam, the way the people were dressed, the way the people uh, uh, the shoes they they have, that was the entrance real to to the to the Dutch history of that time, because if we compare our history of 17th century, and uh, this I was always giving to my students this example, and the 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 the, the, the Dutch painting. It, it, it gives you how at that time already, it explains you why the West Europe is developed and why the East Europe is undeveloped. Because the, the real uh, uh, reason has already happened at that time. The, uh, at that time already in 17th century, the Holland was a very developed country already. And you see this everything of this, of this painting, of the small thing of the things, how, how the kitchen is organized, of the, of the tools people are, are, are having, uh, are doing these things. And uh, I think in, in, in Dutch uh, tradition, it is, you have this great, great historian, Hoisinga. I don't know how to pronounce this in... Uh, more or less. More or less in, 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 in Swedish, who, who, who exactly is concentrating on the small mm -hmm. thing, who is exactly concentrating on the details. That is concentrating on the small thing, I venture an explanation. Also, um, perhaps born out of um, certain things which were impossible to say in Poland, for example, in the 50s and the 60s. Um, your first book is called In the Polish Bush. Yeah. And there already you try to analyze what's going on in Poland, not by looking at the center, because certain things about the center couldn't be said, but by looking at what happens in the periphery, and much more looking at certain stories concerning daily life, which could perhaps escape, let's say, the formalized way of what could be said and what not. Yeah, but be because uh, uh, through these details, you can see this is a big thing. Mm -hmm. in, in, the, in, in the one uh, drop of the, of, the, of the water, there is a, the whole sea if you look carefully into this. Mm. And uh, if, you, if you look to these uh, details, completely run-down details, mm. completely broken things, completely this landscape which is completely inhuman, you see behind of this the, the reality of the political system. The, 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 you, you, you see behind of this the state of society. Mm. The, 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 the small details uh, uh, what is the difference uh, between, uh, uh, for example, the, the street in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam in, and the street in, uh, in Sofia, for example? It's the same street, mm -hmm. but there are small details very important. This, this details is that it is a clean street, and the other is unclean street. Mm -hmm. And on this street, you will not find the, 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 the rubbish uh, just thrown out. But on the other, yes. 
and you don't need to, to, to compare the political systems. It's just enough to compare this, this small part of the street of these two towns to understand everything. And you have, as a, um, beside writing, you are um, a photographer. And I just saw a book which appeared in Poland, um, a book um, with photos on, uh, mainly on Africa. And um, to what extent is um, photography important for your writing? I can remember, for example, one scene in your book uh, on Iran where you explain revolutions start with people losing fear. And then you see this huge crowd, and then you become more and more specific, and then you say a revolution starts when one person loses fear. The first person losing fear, and then you, in a very vivid description, you see this one person opposite to this one policeman saying you have to move, and he decides not to move. And then things start to tumble, with one person losing fear, and then two, it's a very photographic way, I thought, of describing a scene, a very compelling image. Well, we are living in an uh, audiovisual civilization, and the impact of, of the picture is a very strong one, of the good picture, of telling mm -hmm. picture. Sometimes it's much stronger than the story you, you are writing of this, so the, the, the one picture is, is, is a very powerful means of communication, of interaction. So uh, to make a, a good picture, it gives a, a great satisfaction. To make a picture which, which will really tell you everything is, is, is a big art. And I art always... Art selection. Uh, yes, and, and the, the, the symbolic meaning mm. of, the, of, the, of the picture. That was one of my colleagues, uh, uh, American, uh, no, it was a, 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 a British photographer made a, a fantastic picture which he, he won. This picture of, of, this, of this man who is staying in, in Tiananmen in Peking. Mm. Uh, in front of the Yes, in tank. front of the tanks. It tells you everything. It tells you about the, 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 the power of the man. Mm -hmm. It tells you of, of the strength of the resistance. You, you don't need even uh, any, any, any uh, description of this picture. It, it's everything in this picture. That is this picture like uh, of this child in Sudan, in South Sudan, who is dying. And uh, it's just uh, it, behind of this child, a few, met few meters away, is staying and and is staying a uh, bird, who is just waiting until he died, just to jump on him and start to, to 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 eat him. I made a picture a few years ago, and this picture is in, in this album, when I visited the the refugee camp, on the border between Sudan and Ethiopia, of dying people, people dying of hunger. And, uh, you describe this this scene also in the book on Africa. Yeah, so this is and, yeah. And yeah. The, this this picture was a picture of, of a group of wo of women, mm. African women, Dinka tribe, which uh, well, usually they are naked because they have nothing, but the the the, the human aid come, and the, and there was the bags with the with the corn. And they they tear this 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 the, the this bags. They throw away the corn because they use these bags, very primitive uh, the bags, just to cover their bodies. Mm -hmm. And for them, the, the woman uh, dying of of hunger, the dignity of of woman, the dignity of woman mm -hmm. body was such a strong that they prefer to, 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 to use these this bags just to cover their bodies because they, very, they were very ashamed of, but of for, this. For, and for uh, and I, I, I made this picture uh, and, and I, I put the, the subtitle to the pictures uh, our, Sudanese, our Sudanese sisters mm -hmm. because they are part of, of, of our, Sudan, our, our human uh, family. But that reveals that subtitle reveals also that for you observing is identifying and a sense of identification and writing 
is also identification, because um, uh, you often said, I cannot write about people whose fate I don't share. So you went um, to situations and you exposed yourself in quite extreme circumstances, always, I guess, with the knowledge that there was an escape, and that the people whom fate you were sharing could not escape. But isn't that, is that, um, let's say, a choice born out of be, trying to be as truthful as possible, or is there also a strong moral imperative? I think it's both, because I think to have a right to, 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 to write about you have to share these uh, calamities of, of, of their situation, of their life. I'm not speaking about uh, writing about people who are living a good life, mm -hmm. but people who are living a, a really terrible life. You have to know what does it mean, a terrible life. To understand what is uh, suffering is just to have a right, moral right, for yourself. Mm -hmm. I, I, I am doing for my own... Uh, psychological comfort uh, that, uh, that I have to, if I'm writing, because I really was living with them. And you know, the majority people in, the, in our planet, who are at the moment six billion people on, on our planet, each year 80 million people are coming to, to, our, mm. to, to our life. But majority of the people in our planet are living very poor and very bad life. We don't, uh, we don't understand that, that, the, that the human life is, 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 a, is, is, a, is a very hard and a very difficult thing. We don't feel this unless we, we touch this, those realities. And unless we, we are living in a, uh, we are living their life. But if you want to, to know, uh, for example, to, to, to write, in, and if I'm writing about Africa, I, I have to sleep in, 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 the, in the slums. And in the slums, where it's a small place, and there are 20 people sleeping, one over the other, and, and, and their mosquitoes are coming because it's a night. And mosquitoes are tiny, starting to bite you. Mm -hmm. And you have no way to escape this, you know. It's, it's a lot of suffering in such a situation. But don't you and hurt, you hurt have, on But this. you have to know this. You but have to you, understand don't this. Don't you reach there the same limits as every anthropologist yeah. tries to identify and tries to become a part of a reality because of which, of course, you can never become in a strong yeah, sense of the word. Yeah, uh, but, but, uh, but you know, anthropology is uh, journalism is anthropology. Well, your journalism yeah, is. Yeah, it is anthropology. I know a lot of yeah. journalism that isn't. Yeah, because you have to, 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 to share this. You, you, you have to, 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 to understand this. I was just telling the, to, today the story when, about the hunger. The whole village is a morning. The whole village is a morning. The whole village is waking up. The children, the, the women, the, the men are coming out of this mat, the hat, this poor hat, they are coming, there is a sun that is hot from the very, very mo early morning, and in the whole village there is nothing to eat. And, and you are waking up together with them, and you also have nothing to eat, because you, you have to, to share the situation. And this is not only in this moment there is nothing to eat, you know already that the, the, the day is coming and the whole day you will have nothing to eat. And you have no place to escape. The desert is all around. Uh, there, is no, uh, there is no work. There is nothing to do. And that is, that is, uh, you have to experience this morning and this feeling you have of such a morning yeah. to, to, to have a right to... to to, 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 to write about these people later, because you know the people, uh, the, the people need right. the people needs authenticity. Mm. When you are writing, and the only way to 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 
to prove this authenticity is your, with your own experience. That's it, but with your own experience in your youth, for example. I would say the authenticity is that you're right about circumstances of colonialism with all the inequality and racial prejudice which went along in Poland, yeah. uh, with hunger which you experienced in your youth in uh, Pinsk. All these experiences which you now discover and try to capture in Africa were part of a European reality as well. Exactly. A forgotten reality by most exactly. of us here. We, we don't, uh, we, don't uh, we, we forgot already that the Europe was also, in many parts of Europe, was also a power. You know, the Hamson book, uh, is mm -hmm. the title has a, a hunger, it was a hunger in Norwegian. Norwegian was one of the most poorest places in the world at the beginning of, of this century. Mm -hmm. And uh, many parts of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the Europe are still very poor. Uh, look at the Balkans. I, I just two weeks ago was in 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 Croatia, and the villages in Croatia is, is, is extreme poverty. So uh, we are still living uh, the, 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 the the affluent mm. part of the world is still very limited. The majority, even even in Europe, we have a, 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 a big regions of. I'm not speaking about. Uh, uh, Romania, I'm not speaking about Bulgaria, about uh, Macedonia, about uh, Ukraine, about uh, Belarus, about mm. all these regions are very poor, still. Mm. So uh, to, to write about this, you, you, you have to, 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 to be, for the, at least for some time, the part of this world. It gives you the moral right to write about it. Let's uh, finish before um, asking the audience to intervene. Um, with one or two questions on um, decolonization. Um, you often said that uh, Toynbee is one of your great heroes and one of your um, examples. Now, of course, there is in Toynbee a lot of historical, grand historical synthesis, which is completely at odds with what you are writing, which is very much shunning abstraction and very close observation. But I felt that, in a sense, uh, Toynbee could be explained to be an example. That is, that he said that this whole idea of a Eurocentric idea of the world, we have to finish with that. We have to learn what the non-Western world has learned. We had to cope with Western influences because they couldn't avoid it. And now the West has to learn what the non-Western world, what the impact of their reality will be on ours. Is that something, uh, let's say, an inspiration for you? Well, it is. It, 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 it was uh, his idea was uh, it, it was a, a verb verbalization, explanation of the very fact that that we in Europe we are we have behind in our history we, we are living 500 years, dominating the world, all world because European values, not only European presence, but European values, European philosophy, European technology, everything was dominant for 500 years, for half of the, of the passing millennium. So we are used to this, that, that, that we are proudly and, and feeling ourselves, the culture, the civilization, which was shining all over our planet with, with our value, with our work. Which is very painful to, to admit this mm -hmm. and to, to, to think about this. And uh, recently, last uh, two years, I made a tour all over this world. I was in uh, Latin America, I was in, uh, again in Africa, in Asia, and I suddenly, I, I noticed, and I was going to these places for 40 years, suddenly I, I noticed that European is disappearing from our planet. The, the Latin America, the countries like Peru, like uh, Bolivia, like Paraguay, the countries like in, in, in Africa, like, uh, like Rhodesia, like uh, 
Tanzania, like uh, uh, Zambia. The countries in, uh, in, in, in Asia, like uh, India, like uh, Pakistan, like Sri Lanka, was full of Europeans. But now there are no more Europeans there. The, the only Europeans are the members of diplomatic corps, representatives of the, the diplomacy. And there are some, uh, some missionaries, but the, 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 the number of them is, is rapidly diminishing. There are less and less missionaries in the world. And, uh, and, and there are some few uh, NGO representatives. But the Europeans, as a, as, a, as a part of the population of those continents, cease to exist. And if you have a, a European population uh, which is leaving Europe, it is leaving Europe only to the rich countries. It's going to Canada, it's going to United States. But in the United States, population is also changing enormously. If you take the, uh, the uh, if you take the United States uh, statistics, beginning of the century, beginning of the century, 95 percent of the immigrants to United States was from Europe. And the end of the century, now, 95 percent of immigrants is from the third world. So the composition uh, of, 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 uh, of these immigrants to, to is changing enormously. And, uh, and this is only a, a, a physical uh, manifestation of the fact that the, that the rule of Europe is changing in the, in the, uh, in the whole world. But, and so we have to, 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 adjust, to, uh, to discuss this problem because it is, uh, it is a, a, a problem of, of that we are living in civilization in which we have not one dominating European uh, culture, but we have many cultures. And there is a new phenomenon also when you are traveling out of Europe. I remember the time when I was traveling as a European, as a white man. People were asking me when I was going to the Arab countries, to, 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 to Asian countries, they were asking me what's about Europe and, uh, and uh, all this sort of questions. Now nobody asks you about Europe. Nobody's interested in this. They are very proud to be uh, Muslims. They are very proud to be Hindi or, or Buddha or but, Confucius. They, they, have their, they discover the value of their own cultures in which they, have, they have feel very, uh, very much inside, they feel very much part of this, and they are proud of this. But so one could say that colonialism was a forced way to integrate people, and now in the era of decolonization, which one could consider uh, as a progress, people inventing and reinventing uh, some of their own traditions, or in a modernized, modernized way, but not living with their eyes fixed to not uh, anymore. The West. Not but anymore. You, but, but you seem a bit ambivalent, but, because on the one hand you say disintegration is stronger in this world than integration, which can't be seen as a positive element. But on the other hand, this cultural pluralism yeah. as such is yeah. not a bad thing. But this ambivalency is a characteristic of our time. Hmm. Because our time is, is a, is a, is, is, it has ambivalence built in in, in, in our culture, in present mm. culture of the world. That you have on the one side, because if you, if you, if you look at the world at, at this moment, you have two contradictory tendencies. The one tendency is, is going toward general integration of our planet. This is a communication system, this is a internet, this is a financial system, and, that, uh, and all this Okay, uh, that's mechanism. a common wisdom, but, but yeah. you say something else dominates. Yeah, well, it, but this is, it's no, no, various, no. you know. No, no, you, you're right yeah, here, but what, what I found interesting, because yeah. there's the common ideas that there are different forces, but you had a rather strong yeah. statement by saying disintegration prevails this in this Disintegration is, is pervading in, in, this, in, this, in this part of the planet. It is not a general piece, it's, it's this part of the planet when you have what's the forces of disintegration, all sort of nationalism, mm -hmm. all sort of fund religious fundamentalism, 
all sort of, of, ethnic, uh, of ethnic chauvinism. All these forces, all sort of, of, uh, of regional uh, ambitions, all these uh, all these forces are waiting, are working against uh, integration. Mm -hmm. So you have the at the present uh, at the present and 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 the world we are living in a, a constant uh, struggle between those two tendencies, which depend on the time. One one part integration is prevailing, or and a few years later, or on another part of the planet. The, the disintegration is prevailing. So it is a constant struggle in, in which, in, uh, according to which we can see and we can understand uh, this, this word in which is so difficult to understand anyway. Well, now it's definitely your task to bring some light into this confusion. So may I invite those who want to criticize, to amend, or question, whatever. Yes, please. You may rise. Małgorzata Bos, correspondent of Polish newspaper Rzeczpospolita. Mr. Kapuściński, maybe you can tell us something about your new forthcoming book where you bring together three non-European civilizations, Hindu, Christianity, and Islam. Maybe some words, because this is what we were talking just uh, about, about different uh, civilizations, non-Europeans. Uh, uh, well, I'm. Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very difficult to. I'm, I'm, it's, it's small question. It's, 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 yes, it's, it's a big question, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you are, well, I wrote this book, which, uh, which is part of the uh, general uh, scheme which I have to, to describe non-European uh, civilizations, non-European continents in the, in the beginning of 21st century. As a matter of fact, we are 20th century living already s several years. According to many uh, polit politologists, to many philosophers, uh, uh, to many um, sociologists and thinkers, that this passing, uh, uh, this passing century was the shortest century in the in the in the contemporary history. This century, this 20th century, begin with a with a beginning of the, of the First World War and ended with the collapse of the communism. And collapse of the communism was 10 years ago, more or less. And so from, from that time, we are living in 21st century, which is, which is completely new. Uh, which, which we are going to live in, in, in a completely new world, hopefully. Now, uh, I was trying to, to look, because we are talking about Europe, a lot about Europe, but what about other cultures and about, what about other civilizations? How they look at the 21st century? What they think about this? How they are preparing themselves to this? If, if, they, if they think that everything is, uh, uh, is okay, they have nothing to, to change, they have nothing to discuss, or rather, they feel that they have to make us as important adjustment and important renovation with their culture, with their civilization. It is a very interesting question, because in Europe here we discuss constantly about this. It is a big literature. Every month, every year, you have a new publications, new books, because European mind is a critical mind. European mind is a, is a mind who is asking questions. European mind is a, is a is an unquiet mind, but uh, but what about other civilizations? Did they rise? This, uh, did they have the same problem? So I started to travel uh, now around the world just to find out what is the state of of those cultures and those civilizations, because in in numbers they are of course much much bigger than that we are. 
we are only the 10% of, of, of population as Europeans. We are only and you, you think this shifting um, demography yeah. will it influence us? Because it's, it's a general thing to say that you know, the, the size of European or Western population on the whole is shrinking. But yeah. to what extent, I mean, I'm always asking myself, to what extent will it really transform it, it, it the way has, we live? It has no uh, immediate transformation. It has no immediate impact. But with the time, with the time, it might have important impact, not only because our population is shrinking. There is another question which is uh, very important, that our population is, is aging, mm -hmm. you know. The, 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 our uh, uh, European population is the oldest population in the, in, in, in the, in the world, in our planet, I mean, as, as, a, as a Promedian. Mm -hmm. So those two elements, that we are uh, smaller, smaller in numbers, and we are older, older in the age. That two elements will have uh, will have influence. Look Through at the at, well, look at, the, at at the contradictory situation which uh, European uh, we, we find ourselves. To cope with the with the tremendous uh, strength of economy of certain Asian countries, of of American, of of, of Canada. Europe has to increase their, their uh, productivity. But to increase the productivity, Europe has to import the working force. So immigration the, will be... Immigration is, is a contradictory because we have the forces in Europe which are against this, where are fear immigration. But on the other, uh, other uh, hand, we have to understand that without immigration, we are, we are losing everything because we, are, we, we, we were, uh, will be losers in, the, in, 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 this, uh, in this struggle for, uh, for the place in the, in, the, in the modern world. So this is a very big contradiction built in European, mm -hmm. in European situation. And uh, so uh, I was very much concerned with, uh, with, all, with all this question mm -hmm. to ask them out of the European context, out of the European borders, to go to these places when, uh, when uh, other civilizations, other cultures, and to ask representative what intellectuals there, you know, the, the, the priests, the, 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 the scholars, what they think about this. And that's, I think, is a... You will is a, keep the answer. Yeah. Because one is, of course, the question is burning. What were the answers? But yeah. we won't ask that question uh, now. Good evening. I'm going to ask you a much easier question to answer. Ah. Um, I th uh, two ideas that you were talking about this evening and I thought were interesting. You talked, on the one hand, about poverty and, and the hardship of life and trying to uh, find an honest way to write and represent that poverty and um, the ability of people even in poverty to find dignity, the Sudanese sisters finding clothes. And at the same time, you talked about um, the perversions of power structures and politicians being different than just human beings and your privilege in being present as often poor men uh, changed the map and became free men and they entered uh, our human community. So that, that somehow it, it seemed that the, the issue of poverty and hardship uh, and liberty and dignity are somehow separate but connected. Um, and that colonialism was in a way responsible for both, but they're different things. How do you see um, poverty and exclusion from uh, human participation now in the 21st century, now that we have seen the breakdown of empire and, and even in, in these, maybe the 21st century is about to begin for Indonesia, but how do you see with the end of empire, um, what is the new um, force denying people their, their possibility to enter the human family and denying people human dignity? Uh, that we very easy against. question indeed. <laughs> <laughs> you asked very, yeah. No, no, what, what I'm, I'm not going to answer. What is the, what's the question? I what's know, the question? I didn't have this. Okay. Sorry, the question, the question no, no, easier. No. If, if poverty no, no. and <laughs> no, poverty... No, I will, he will, he will explain me. I will try to uh, summarize I, yeah. it. 
and forgive me if I missed some of the detours, but I guess the basic question was, is what is denying people now participation in what was called the human family, yeah. or what prevents people from really participating in a world economy in gestation? I think that is a difficult question, actually. But I don't understand the question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, these are the moments when one sinks into deep despair, but... <laughs> it's difficult to explain what someone else um, asks. But I guess the question is um, about social inequality. What prevents, you know, what produces perhaps uh, social inequality at a world scale now, where you, you described oh, some, somewhere in your question. book that, this that, is that, a that, 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 that the distance between yeah. those who have and the have not yeah. is growing, whereas yeah. a lot of people are arguing uh, the opposite, that you can't escape each other anymore, and that we live in an interdependent world which is connected, and that yeah. the fate of those who are being marginalized will affect through immigration or through catastrophes sooner or later, the prosperous world. Yeah. And so, and you are arguing in some of your books that these are two nations or two worlds apart, which hardly seem to touch each other. Yeah, this is a very big question. It's a, it's a, it's a fundamental uh, problem. Well, you know, generally the, the problem uh, of the contemporary world is, the, 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 the general problem is that we have in a scale, is a world scale, the tendency to, to, to grow. But the drama is that this growth generates inequality. So we have the, the general growth, but the, the results of this growth are unequally distributed. And that is a problem. This is a key problem of, of contemporary world that we have more and more everything, of everything. We have more and more cars. We have more and more people, first of all. We have more and more uh, television sets. We have more and more schools. We have more and more chairs. We have more and more glasses. We have more and more everything. But the, dis because, but the distribution of this wealth is very unequal and is continuing to be very unequal. I, uh, we can take as an example that uh, if we take a year, uh, 40 years ago, 1960, in 1960, the difference between the 20% of the rich, rich people, of uh, affluent people of the, of the planet and 20% of the poorest, was the difference was 30 times. Now, in the middle of, of 90s, this difference is 81 times. So this difference is growing, although the general, the general progress is, is continuing. But, but the distribution is, is very unequal, and that is the main problem. And there is no any plan, there is no any... Uh, but is there any necessity? I mean, can those who live on a sort of insulated prosperity, yeah. can they insulate themselves? Can they, How they? ignore, um, well, I mean, there well, seems to be a sort of sentiment of invulnerability. Yeah. Theoretically, they can't, but, 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 but uh, how you can force the people that they will give uh, what they have to, to the other, how you, how you can do this? Well, what, mean, was, what, the, what the mechanism you have, well, what the, the institutions? State, the welfare state was built on that, yeah, but fear what, of, of those of the yeah. haves for but um, the welfare state was practically uh, damaged and you know, liquidated by Thatcherism. And, and the welfare state, you can say, in, in, a, in Europe, again, you are ca ta taking the example of I know, Europe. But, I mean, but, but of the course, welfare... there are some people dreaming of and hoping for, yeah. let's say, that the same pressure yeah. and the same fear but we don't and the have... same pressure through immigration yeah. will force a more equal distribution. Yeah. It, it, it might be, it, let's, let's hope this way, but there is no any mechanism to do this. Mm. You know? There is no any structures. You know, we are living in the world who is not ruling by anybody. We, 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 we are not thinking about this uh, always. But let's remember one thing, 
that we are living on our planet, six billion people, and nobody is ruling this planet. There is no any, any government, there is no any institution who is ruling this planet. And uh, so you can't uh, introduce any general uh, project uh, to, to, to our planet because there is no such an institution who can do this. And that's the problem. Okay, sorry. Please. Um, a short uh, question. You have been to Africa for the last 40 years, ever since the decolonization started and up to now. Um, about three months ago, the journal, The Economist, called Africa the hopeless continent. Do you agree with that sentiment? And if you do, why? And if you don't, why not? <laughs> <laughs> But we uh, agree agreed to with, with what? I don't which, hear. Which, I'm sorry. I don't no, hear what so you're asking. So the question was, that it was I think, an economist. There was um, a phrase about Africa as the hopeless continent. Ah. And the question is, do you agree? And if so, yeah. why? Yeah. And if you don't agree, then it's also begging the question. Ah, good. Fine. Next question. That's a question. Uh, no, but but uh, but there are other questions because maybe uh, you know. Uh, to, uh, You're taking over. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely impossible. Yeah. Well, I will tell you, Africa. Uh, well, first of all, it's very difficult to to to, to talk about about Africa as a whole. Africa is a is a over 30 million square kilometers. 30 million square kilometers. It's a huge continent. Africa is almost one billion people of different cultures, religions, and everything. Africa uh, is 30, 52 states, very different states. So for me, for somebody who knows really this, the Africa, it's for very difficult to, 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 to talk in these very general categories. Yeah, but so, excuse me. The economists, they felt that they could generalize of, of us for 50 countries. Mm. What? So, I see. The economists felt that they could give a generalized opinion on 52 countries, cool. which the, the economists, the weekly. But I'm not working in economists. I can't, <laughs> <laughs> I can't be responsible for what they, for what they write. That's, I'm sorry. It's, it's, I'm, well, I will say this. You know, we are just for simplification. We are just using these general terms. We are using terms uh, Asia, for example. We are, we are using terms Africa or something like that. But those realities of those places are I I incredibly complicated and, uh, and very, very, very different. So in the Africa, Africa generally, if, if to speak Africa in general, Africa has two problems which is very difficult to overcome. The one problem is a problem of very harsh climate in, in, in a, a big part of, of the continent. And the African, the second problem, big problem, is, is, is a very poor, poor soil. So those, those two problems make already put Africa in a very difficult situation. The third problem of Africa is a question of lack of, of of drinking water. The fourth problem is a de deforestation. The, I hear, this is a continent with a, a lot, a lot of problems, objective problems, not uh, dependent on culture, on, uh, on, uh, on, 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 uh, on, on religion or, or, or society or nothing like that. Now, to answer your question, if it is a uh, continent, uh, doomed to, to, to despair and something like that, or, or no, is to, to say that you have in Africa very different situations. You have the countries which are doing very well. You have Botswana, you have uh, Ghana, you have, uh, you have Senegal and, and many other countries. And you have the countries which are in a very terrible state. So it is, you, 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 it, to answer this question is to, to ask a very specific subject. More than that, you have even in the countries, you have completely two different situations. You take the Sudan, for example, when the North Sudan is, 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 a, is a quite, uh, uh, in a quite good shape, 
and the thousand Sudanese is, 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 in, is in the hell for, for 30 years already, complete destruction of the people and, and environment. So it depends on the, which place you are talking. But then the answer will be yes or no. But perhaps there's one general remark in your book on Africa, which could give a clue, um, is where you say that one of the tragedies of colonialism was that it forced people with very different traditions, often in one state, and then in the period after these national liberation movements came to the fore, that it proved to be very difficult to build stable democracies or even unstable democracies in these multi-ethnic multi uh, societies which, had, which were forced somehow through colonialism to live together. Yeah, but, but you can't change this, uh, you, you can't do nothing about this. The only possibility is to build societies uh, in respectful of, of, of the of difficulties to build those societies inside the, the borders mm -hmm. you have now. In uh, The borders are unchangeable. You can't change these borders because otherwise you will unleash the, 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 the war of the continental scale, which is now impossible. Well, Dutch peace, peacekeepers are going to prove the dif difference yeah. because they, um, they will now defend the border of Eritrea, and exactly. which was a changed border. Exactly, the they are going to do this. Yes. They are going to, to, to defend the border because the defending of the border is, is a fundamental thing in, in yeah, African society. That was a new society. border, I mean, it's 30 years old. Any, any border. But I'm not going to ask you about yeah. the wisdom of Dutch peacekeepers because yeah. you might give an answer. Thank you. And it will be very discouraging. Thank you. Please. Well, my name is Peter Sagar and I have a question which relates to that. And I'm going back to uh, Mr. Kapuczynski's remarks about our golden age and Paul Scheffer's uh, remarks about Toynbee and learning uh, between cultures. Mr. Kapuczynski, do you think that the different colonial powers over hundreds of years have had a different impact on the civilization of African people? Notably the difference between South and East and West, the English, the Portuguese, the Dutch, and do you think that there is any, any remaining influence from that in sensing democracy, in sensing the way people behave between each other? Yeah, okay. Uh, of course, uh, that uh, they are differences because uh, they, they left completely different uh, legacies uh, of, 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 their, uh, of their stay. First of all, there was a different lens of colonial uh, presence in Africa. And the different, uh, the, the different uh, lens was be before the countries, for example, Portuguese was uh, the, the longest uh, colony, had the longest colonies in Africa. Whereas the, the, the British uh, have uh, shorter and the French most, most shorter, and Italians still very, 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 very short period. So that was the first difference. This, the other difference was uh, in, 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 was in the, uh, in the culture of, of, of mother countries, mother colonial countries. <laughs> and the British culture different from French culture, French culture different from, uh, from uh, Portuguese culture, and so on, so on, we'll come to this. And the third difference was a difference depending on the on the uh, on the economic strength of the mother uh, of the mother uh, country of the of the of the no, not of the colony but of the colonizer. Depend on I will tell you an example for example of of Portuguese colonialism, which was the longest colonialism in Africa, and the poorest one. It was such a poor. Uh, poor colonialism, uh, that uh, uh, in Luanda, which is the capital of, of Angola, the first uh, street lamps, first street lamps was built only in 20th century. So up to the 20th, uh, 20th century, and, and at this moment, Portuguese was in Luanda 400 years. For 400 years, Portugal was unable to build a single paved road on the, on, 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 in Luanda and to put a single, inst install a single lantern. 
and, and Portuguese was using their colonies just to send the, the poor people and to send the, the thieves, the, the beggars to send, in, uh, to send to these colonies. When I came first to, 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 to Luanda in 1973, it was still a lot of Portuguese there. I was shocked to see in Africa, on the street, white beggars. The, the, you can't imagine such a picture in a in British colony. You, you, to, to go to, 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 to British colony, you have to have in, in your country, in Britain, certain uh, material minimum to be sent there. You, you, you can't be very poor to be sent to, 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 to the colony. So there was a difference, and, and Portuguese was using uh, Angola, Mozambique, uh, Cap Verde as, as, as a place to, to discharge the poverty from, 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 from the Portugal, which itself was a very poor country. So the, there was this difference was in, this, uh, in, in, in the use of, of the colonies. Now, there was a great difference between uh, uh, colonialism, French and, 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 and British colonialism. The, the, in the French colonialism, the criterion was not so much the color of the skin, but the level of education. If you were educated man, if you have a university uh, uh, formation, you, have to, you, you can be accepted in the French society. Because for the French people, the francophonie is a criterion, decisive criterion. So you, you can have the situation during the colonial time in French colonies, when you, you came to, 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 to French colonies, when you came to Dakar, when, when you came to Abidjan, when, when, you, when you came to, to Ouagadougou, you will see the, the, the Africans, Africans, but educated Africans, just freely mixed with the, with the, with the French colonists, with the, with the French white bourgeoisie. That was normal. The, the France was treated, their colonies, as a part of France, as a part of France, big, big France entity. There's a continuation to prolongation of, of, of France. So even now, if you, if you go to, to, to several countries, and if you go to Abidjan or to go to, to Dakar, you can buy the same day the Le Monde, the, the Figaro, is is still a sort of small Paris. It was not the case with the British colonies. The, the, the British colonies have very strict aloofness toward non-British, which in this case means Africans. And the British was the, was the first to quit Africa completely. For, for, for the French, is still a lot of sentiment to, toward Africa. For, for the French, it's, it's very difficult to go out of the Africa. To, to, they, 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 they like to stay there. They like to, 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 to live there. B British packed and, uh, and left completely. And in, in British countries, uh, for, for, for example, uh, when you have the, the, the bookshops, the libraries in, 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 in British uh, col colonies like Dar es Salaam, like Kampala, uh, like Nairobi, there was very, very good, very well uh, stocked uh, bookshops, for example, with British books. Mm -hmm. with, uh, with, the, uh, with the departure of, of British people from, this, from those countries, no bookshops are existing at all. So uh, French, uh, English people, except of the language, of course, they took with them everything. The French are still uh, have a lot of sentiment and still uh, they like, for example, the old colonial people, they like to stay there. And uh, so th those differences are numerous. There is a difference between uh, Italian uh, co colonialism uh, uh, power in et, et, remnants in, in Ethiopia and, and Somalia and Libya, and uh, Belgium, for example, in, 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 in Congo. Each of these countries has uh, left uh, different traces 
very much depending on, on, their, uh, on their home European uh, culture and, and, and European uh, tradition. Thank you. Two more questions, I guess, and then... Sorry? Oh! oh. <laughs> yes. Nice to meet you. Uh, do you want to raise a question as well? Yes, and since you're elevated above us, okay. please speak. This was more or less um, the reverse of the question about the economist, yeah. which... Uh, <laughs> no, you end your book with a very hopeful and yeah. um, description of what it means. Uh, a community you describe somewhere in Africa, collected around a tree. Yeah with some nostalgia, and I think that's what you were asking for. But if, what, what is the question, I'm sorry? The question is, can you... Which is hopeful. Ah. Well, you know, the, always people are, are asking here. me. Yes, people are always asking me. My... Well, I... As, as, as I first time went to Africa in 58, so it is already over 40 years. And, but uh, I was not live all the time, of course, in Africa, but I was living more or less altogether eight years permanently in Africa, in different parts of Africa. I was uh, lucky because I was a correspondent of a very small and poor press agency. So whenever something, and so I was nominated only one correspondent for the whole continent. <laughs> so whenever something happened, I was, Going there, my colleagues uh, of, of Reuters or, uh, or uh, of, uh, of Associated Press was in a, a much much worse situation because they were only one for each country. So if if he has a coup d'état, so he has only in his country. Uh, but I was covering all coup d'état. <laughs> so, uh, Which is a dubious privilege. Yes, yeah, well, but but it is for for the journalists is, is important. Anyway. People are asking me what was my, what, what was my experience with, uh, with African people. I'm always saying that was excellent experience. They are very, very good people. They are very hospitable people. The ones they accept you as, your, as, 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 as their guest, they are taking charge of everything. You, you can sleep quietly, nothing will happen to you. And uh, I, 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 I like to be there. I like to, 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 to live there because I always, I always uh, will find uh, a help for, 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 for from those people. And I don't uh, share these uh, opinions and uh, about this, uh, about all this. I like Kaplan, for example, that is mm -hmm. the American uh, writer. Of the earth. Yeah. And I don't share this, this hysteric uh, attitude because I think uh, it never happened anything to me. I mean, uh, always happened a lot of things during the war because there is a war. So it is not a war, it's a war. It's a war is everywhere the same. But uh, in normal peaceful uh, time, in normal peaceful situation, I always was sharing, uh, was uh, uh, receiving the, 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 the very good attitude, support, smile, uh, gratitude, and everything. I was to to talking about, uh, the, I was giving the example of, 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 of my colleague, the, the, the British uh, uh, man, it was years ago, uh, when he was a, a young man and he decided to walk across Africa. And, uh, Practically, after some time, and he he make a lot of preparation and studying the maps and 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 dress and everything. Uh, but after he has to resign after a few days, after several days, because people seeing the white man walking, they were stopping the cars and they said, "Please join <laughs> us." <laughs> but he was saying, "No, no, no! I I have I want to walk." So, but was looking, he's crazy. <laughs> 
it, but 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 this is a, a good example of 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 the hospitality of these people because they they see this 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 poor mm -hmm. uh, white man who sweating <laughs> we know <laughs> going with. Uh, uh, having this problem, so please join us, please, please go with us. And so, uh, so and he he protested, he refused to, and he 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 has he eventually he 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 he, he resigned because he said no, I I can't I, I, I can't continue this way, but this is an example of of only of attitude. Of course, if you you have a, you have the bandits uh, as you have everywhere. You have the uh, you uh, and the war they they, they 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 may kill but at the war they, they they are killing everybody, so but in normal normal life normal society normal village in in normal town you will always meet with with a with a lot of understanding sympathy, and help. So uh, that is my experience, and uh, so I'm just trying to, 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 to reflect these feelings in my book. Okay, thank you. Last two questions. Kapuscinski, my name is Gary Schwartz. You spoke earlier of the disappearance from Asia, Latin America, Africa of Europeans. I don't know whether your interlocutor, Paul Schaeffer, has mentioned this to you, but a while ago he wrote an article concerning the opposite phenomenon, and that Ooh. is Paul Schaeffer. Yep. Yes, him. Yes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can explain everything. <laughs> I'll do it for <laughs> About the opposite phenomenon, that is the arrival on European shores of people from the Mediterranean area, the African countries, uh, South America, and so forth. And this article of his gave rise to one of the most successful uh, and intriguing public debates in the Netherlands. Uh, concerning what he thought of as the denial of Dutch society in dealing with this uh, very uh, uh, this phenomenon and this problem. Now, the debate did not lead to a result. We're not yet finished uh, discussing this, and I wonder what your view is of the immigration into Europe of populations from outside. Is this going to continue at an increased pace? Is it going to change Europe unrecognizably? And how should Europe deal with this? Yeah. Uh, well, this is a big <laughs> question. <laughs> it's a pure uh, statistics are, are, are proving this. Mm. That uh, European people are not going anymore to the third world countries. If you take, uh, for example, I will give you an example of, of Polish community. If you, if you take the 19th century, in the 19th century, in any country of, of, of Latin America, for example, and Asia, and Africa, there was a big immigration toward those continents from Europe. Huge immigration. And there was emigrating not only colonialists, so-called colonialists, but they were emigrating the doctors, they were emigrating engineers, engineers. The whole big projects every, everywhere were built by European engineers, by European workers in there. If you go to Cameroon, Cameroon was a German colony. And in, in Cameroon, all bridges, up today, bridges, road, everything was built by German engineers. And, uh, and with, with quite often with German workers. There is not a single German, e e except British, uh, e except German ambassador uh, anymore in, uh, in, in Cameroon. The same is going on in all countries. And uh, the, 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 I'm repeating that uh, European uh, population is shrinking, uh, I mean, is disappearing from the planet and is concentrating only to if now you have the you, we, we have, for example, in Sudan, we had a, a quite a big, uh, quite a big uh, immigration to, 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 to Sudan. Uh, in, and now I was now in Khartoum. Now the, the youngest immigrant has something like 70 years or 75 years. No one is coming since like about 20 or 30 years. So this is, this is a new, new phenomenon. And a reverse tendency you have, I mean, toward Europe and 
principally toward the United States. And uh, if, if you have immigration from Europe, or for example, you have immigration now from, uh, from uh, Eastern Europe. From Eastern Europe, a lot of people want to emigrate and are emigrating. But they are not emigrating to the third world countries. As they, everybody goes to, to Western Europe or everybody goes to America or to Canada. But not a single person wants to emigrate to, is going to the, to the third world. It's a completely new uh, state of mind and a, a, a new situation. And, uh, and here as uh, emigration are reversed from, from the other countries, will we'll, we'll, we'll we'll try to come to, 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 to Europe. It is not big movement, again. It is a lot of uh, exaggeration saying that it's uh, millions of, of people from the third world want to come coming to Europe and so on and so on. It is, it is, it is not true. But, but, but it is still some sort of, uh, sort of immigration, especially to, to the countries like uh, France, to the countries like, uh, like, like Germany. But Germany, Germany consciously imports the, the, the people from those countries because uh, they, they, they need the workers for the economy. And they have a powerful economy which has a tremendous problem of, of lack of, 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 of uh, working force, the working force. And to, to run this economy and to, to compete on the world market, you, 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 you can't uh, afford to have too expensive uh, world, uh, working force because the product will be unable to compete on the world market in which the products from Asia are much, much cheaper. Why uh, Europe is not more interesting in Africa? For a very simple reason. Because European products are too expensive for African uh, pocket. African can't buy products uh, which were, was made in Holland, in, uh, in Sweden, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in France and so on, because they are too expensive. So there is no market anymore, there is no market for European products in Africa. Because if you go to small places in Africa, to small towns, small villages, you see the products in, uh, in Africa are Chinese, are Hindi, are Malaysian. They are cheap, cheap uh, African, uh, cheap uh, uh, Asian products. And uh, Chinese production and Malaysian production, tai Taiwan production, uh, uh, Indian production, that is, that is the, the uh, 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 that is the production which is for these countries. So Europe has no markets in, this, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, in Africa. So Europe is not more interesting in Africa. Europe is not interesting in Africa also because now at the present state of technology, you have a lot of synthetic materials which can, uh, which can uh, substitute the, the, the natural uh, products of, of of African soil, of cotton, of, 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 of different minerals and, and things like that. So the economical reason is one of the answers that why there is no interest in, in, in Africa. Because the interest is always going after economical interest. And there is no much economical interest in these relations. So this is a short answer to, to, to the question of, of migration and everything. Thank you. Um, we have squeezed already a lot of answers from you, and I know you went through a gruesome routine of six yeah. more interviews this morning and afternoon. So I think we really have to finish with the last two questions. First you, because you were a long time waiting, and then as you will have the last word first. Okay, Mr. Kapuscinski, I read your book. Um, you started your book with the end of the independence of Ghana. and then yeah. you moved on to the end of what? and then you moved on to a lot of other African countries um, what struck me most was that um, you give some thoughts about the nature of decolonization and of colonization uh, and while you were a Polish reporter you managed to uh, let out entirely uh, some Marxist or communists um, 
analysis of the situation in the third world, while the Marxist analysis of uh, the uh, inequalities are very powerful. Uh, so two questions. One, how, did you, how were you able to negotiate with your press agency uh, to leave out communism entirely from your articles? Well, you have plenty of opportunity of doing that. And two, do you believe that the communist explanation of uh, the inequalities um, by um, uh, the exploitation by American trusts and so forth. Do you think that is totally invalid? Do you think it's uninteresting? Or do you think it's a little valid? I don't understand, sorry. <laughs> you know, the question is that uh, I was working in a press agency 40 years ago. So you are asking me what I was doing 40 years ago, or you are asking me the book which I wrote two years ago. Okay. It's, a, it's, a, it's a big oh, difference. Okay. Yeah. So what's the question? Is? Well, generally speaking, he was asking why there are so few people believing in Marxism. This I don't know. In the you East. have to ask these people. Well, you probably you know, yeah. because it was tried. Yeah. So uh, do, I don't know. You have to ask these people. Okay, let's leave it there. You will have the last yeah, question. I don't understand. Yeah, I have a last question for uh, Mr. Kapuczynski. Oh, of course, I know. Ah, so what? Was, of course, the question ah. was, sorry, I was too ironic. Um, uh -huh. The question was, has Marxism still um, uh, something to say on questions of development, dependency, inequality? It depends. It's, 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 there are some parts of ana Marxist analysis which is still used by economists and uh, still by pe people who are uh, writing and, and, and doing uh, about the third world. Yes, of course. Okay. You will have the last word. Yeah, I have a personal question to Mr. Kapuczynski. Um, actually, I wrote, I, I read your first book about the emperor. And uh, what intrigued me was the, uh, the fact, the, uh, the question that, how come that a Polish journalist, we're talking about 40 years ago, the mid 50s, 60s, uh, coming from a to totalitarian political state, diehard communism in every way, and becoming interested having interest for Africa, although the system may be corrupt or whatever, eh, the administration, but life in itself must be some kind of, was it not a fairy tale for you? What? Was it not? A was it? Like a fairy tale, because getting into a fairy tale, comparing uh, so life in Africa that those uh -huh. days, so comparing to Eastern Europe, where mm. you came from at those days. So generally the idea was it not an escape from the grayness of Poland in the 50s and we're not looking for also a sort of exotism while traveling no, to Africa. But why are you questioning the right of Polish people to, to, to be interested in Africa? Why? No, I'm not, que no, I'm not questioning you. What, what's I was wondering what your experience, what, how, did it, how did you experience that? What? What was your experience being in such a society coming from I was describing in my books about this. I was, the, all my books is the answer to this question. I don't I think we, we have to leave it here. And um, while saying that uh, many of his books are still not translated into Dutch, yeah. I think on one point we agreed that I, I, this I is a shame. I wrote 20 books. Yes, you wrote 20 books and at least um, what um, struck me is that the books which are um, published under the title Lapidarium, which are a sort of autobiographical uh, reflection, and which three parts are now, volumes are now um, published, part of them are translated in Germany. And these give a very interesting clue to the rest of your writing. So I think we both will end here by urging the Dutch publisher to go ahead with translating your work. And thank you so much for your time and patience.
I think she wants to say something more. Thank you, Richard Kapuscinski and Paul Scheffer. You've kept us on the tip of our seats tonight for more than an hour and a half. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your presence here tonight. Our next lecture will be with the Chinese-Canadian writer Denise Chong on 12 December in celebration of her book The Girl in the Picture, which is the story of the girl Kim Phuc in the prize-winning photo from the war in Vietnam. On 9 January, CNN's political analyst Bill Schneider will speak on the Clinton legacy. legacy. If you are uh, on our mailing list, you will receive the information. And now I um, would also like to mention that guests of the Polish ambassador Maria Wodzinska are invited to meet in the hall where drinks will be served and where Mr. Kapuscinski will be seated at the book table and he will sign books. Other members of the audience are also welcome to stay on for as long as you like and have your book signed. But now please remain seated before Mr. Kapuscinski and the ambassador have reached the door. Thank you.